Jeff is up next. He said, brother, would you be willing to walk us through the Greek exegesis of John 17, 4 and 5? Or if not, that would be if you'd be willing to exegete Proverbs 3 and 4, how it parallels uh, Jesus's, what Jesus says in John 3, 3 5, 13 through 15. Let's go with the first one, John 17, 4. All righty, so let's go to John 17, 4. Matter of fact, let's just do it this way. Let's let's go to John 17, 4, and let's just, let's go to the very beginning, because there's a lot of things if we are going to keep this in context. By the way, someone someone said, Corey, you, you don't know Greek. All right, fine. All right, fine. <laughs> let's see, mister. Um, now, I'm going to read most of this, obviously, in English, because if I read this all in Greek, well, then half the people or most of the people, a lot of people here would not understand what I'm saying, but I'm going to make this relate. Um... When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Well, he's not speaking about it right now. Oftentimes you'll see in the Bible, you will see or hear them speak about something almost as a as a past tense, but looking forward. One of the examples is in John when Jesus breathes on them and tells them to receive the Holy Spirit. It's looking forward for them to receive the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see this in a, in a passage in just a second. He says, the hour has come. Glorify your son that he may glorify you. Now, what's interesting about this when he says glorify your son, this is in the imperative. But it's not as though that Jesus is giving the father a command, but he is speaking this in the imperative. And he gives a reason why in order that. And, and I want you to focus on this word that's highlighted here, this word in order that. This henna clause, because when you see this, this is it's like the purpose clause of henna. It it's telling us the reason for doing something, the reason why that's important, because we're going to see that in just a second. Matter of fact, um, I don't see Sheila, but let me make these a little bit bigger uh, for everyone else who also might be having problems seeing uh, the, the words that are kind of in a little bit smaller print. But in order that the son uh, would be glorified or they will glorify you. So so he says, Father, hours come glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Wait a second. Now let's, let's pause for a second. Glorify me. That's Jesus speaking in order that the son may glorify you. We talked about this before and it's, it's vitally important to understand what ends God is trying to accomplish. What is God's end game? Well, that is to glorify himself. Now we asked this question before, how does God get glory? And this is where, you know, just kind of Ask everyone and people were saying, well, things like by, by being obedient, by placing our faith in him, by salvation. And those and those are ways that God does get glory. But that's not necessarily how God gets glory. In other words, God's glory is not dependent upon you placing your faith in Christ. God, God's glory is not dependent upon you doing something. God will be glorified irrespective of you, whether you go to hell or heaven. God will get glory whether you were ever born or not. God is going to get glory. And so look what he says now. And by the way, He's speaking of God having glory even before the earth was. And so, and I know you said go through four and five, but we have to go through this before we get to four and five. So he says, glorify your son in order that the son will glorify you, even as or since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life. Now, let's back up again. Let's let's look at this. He says, even though you have given to him authority, authority over all flesh. And then look at the very next word that's here. Let's highlight this again. This henna is used there also, which means in order that the reason why he gave him authority over all flesh is why in order that all the ones which you, which you have given him. So henna pan ha dedokas, which that you have given out to it, which is to him that you may glorify those or to them, give to them I'm sorry, I said glorify, that you would give, look what he says, Altois Zoan Ionion, which is in order that he would give to them eternal life. So now, I'm sorry, I have this on the screen here, but I don't have it on your screen. I'm sorry, guys, I have this up. Y'all forgive me. But notice the henna. He says, in order that uh, the ones that you have given, and by the way, notice the, the tense of this. This is the perfect tense. So in other words, Jesus was, he, he was given who? Now, some might say in this case, he's only speaking about the uh, the apostles or the disciples at this time. Well, at the moment in this these first few verses, 
he's speaking of all mankind. We know that because he says all flesh. But his his being given, he there there have been certain ones that he has been given in order that all the ones that were given. Notice going back to the very the first part, even as Kathos Edokas uh, Alto. So even though or since uh, you've given all or given to him all authority, authority all uh, flesh. So he's speaking not just of the disciples, but of the world all totality. But then he says, in order that all of the ones which or two you have given this didokas is in the perfect tense. So it's a past completed action. That's what the perfect tense is. Unlike what we have in the English. So the ones that Jesus was given in order that the ones that he was given to him, that he would do what? That he would give them life into the ages. So now this necessarily means we have to kind of think back to what Jesus said in earlier passages in John, specifically John chapter six, all that the father has given will come and he will raise them in the last day. Now, these are ways that he is going to get glory. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at something else that speaks about his glory and the works that he that he does. So now we get to verse three. And this is eternal life that they would know you. Now, what is eternal life? Um, this is eternal life. Aute de Aston. Hey, Ionas, Ionias, Zoe. Now here it is. Here's another one. Here's another henna. In order that, let me highlight that, in order that henna, in order that uh, Gnoskosin, which is that they may know or they will know you, the only true God. So the reason why, or he says, this is eternal life. This is eternal life. Eternal life is such so that in order that you will know um, the only God. So when we talk about what life is, what is life? Life is knowing in, in, in the spiritual sense, eternal life is knowing having a relationship with who? with the father from the beginning to the end. God has been after us having a relationship with him, that there be no severing, there be no split, nothing dividing us between him. And so he's always been after this reconciliation with mankind. Now, the problem is, though, there are some, though, that Jesus is staying right here in John 17 that have been given in order that the ones that have been given will know him, will have life. And he, so he says, this is eternal life. What is eternal life? That they, meaning the ones that he have, that he's given to them, given to Jesus, that they will know the father. Now, here we go to uh, what Jeff was getting to. So all of that is introducing what Jeff just uh, brought up. So I glorified you on earth. Now, look what he says, this part is interesting. He says, I glorify you. Man, let me pause these questions here so I because I'm missing a lot of questions as I'm going. He says, I glorified you on earth. Now, a couple of things. Do y'all see this word right here? This is ego. This is I. Okay. Now, he also states this here. He says, say, which is you, and then odak oh, I mean, sorry, oh, edoxaxa, which is I have glorified. So he didn't need to have the word ego there. The word ego add something extra, a little emphasis to something. And so he says, I myself, I'm the one that's bringing some glory. I myself am going to glorify you and to do so where? Epe taste gaze, which is upon the earth. So you need to understand God is also glorified in heaven, but he's also glorified in earth. Here's the interesting thing. Who brings God glory on earth? Well, this is pretty easy to understand. Jesus is the one who brings God glory on earth. Why? He is the glory of the Father. He is, remember what John says in John 1, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the uh, only begotten Son, the glory of the Father. We beheld him. So Jesus is the glory. And so how is God glorified? Through his son, Jesus. He gets glory. He is glorified both now and forever. And he's always been glorified in the past, which means God has always been glorified and always will be glorified. He says, so this ego here, this is I myself, I'm doing this. I'm not leaving up to these, these chickens here that you left here, Lord. This is me. I, we're the chickens, by the way. Uh, I myself have glorified you on the earth. And he, look, he says, having accomplished, and this word, uh, the teleosas, which is having accomplished, this is an aorist active participle, even though it says aorist, 
Eric's Eris um, is just kind of the 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 ending that that's put on. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's a past action. Uh, this doesn't have any aspect uh, of time. And now it could be. We don't know. But it's what, what, what we would just rather say, just kind of undefined. And so the work which I have accomplished uh, that you have given to me in order that I will do. So the son has been given work to do. And so in this work, he has accomplished it. Now, has he accomplished the work? So that's the question. Has Jesus at the moment that he's making this statement has he actually accomplished the work? Well, no, he hasn't. But he's speaking, uh, looking forward to what he is going to do on the cross. It's not going to stop. This train is not. This train is on time, and it will not be stopped. And so, this is what he's speaking up. And so, he ultimately does get this glory that he is asking for. But also, this presupposes something else we need to talk about: who Jesus is. Let's go to. Let's go to the Old Testament. Let's go to Isaiah forty-two eight because this needs to be brought up as well. The Lord says, I am the Lord. And remember, we are told in Deuteronomy 32, 32, yeah, 32, um, not 32, I'm sorry. Oh, my mind just went blank. We're told in Deuteronomy 4, 35, 39, that the Lord is God, even in this discourse that, that, that Moses is having with the Lord, that the Lord is God. I am the Lord. That is my name. By the way, this word name, this word uh, Sham, or Shem, in this case, uh, Shemi, which is my name, the word Sham is me, and then the pronoun suffix E is my, so my name is the Lord. Is that his name? Well, not his nomenclature like Frank, Bob, Doug, Pearl, Betty, no. This is who he is, what he does. This is all about him. So when we think about the word name, it's not thinking about it the way that we would think about it in our understanding. Name refers to also a person's reputation. In this case, God's reputation, who he is, what he does. This is who he is. Uh, that is my name. I will, here it is, I will give my glory. I will not give my glory to another. So if Jesus is making this statement back in John 17 to give me back the glory, that's a difficult statement. As a matter of fact, it's a blasphemous and a dangerous statement unless he actually is God. And so what Jesus is stating here is that he is God and he was given work to do by God. How does that make sense to us? Well, it doesn't really to us because we're not God. We don't understand. We are not, we don't exist um, as three persons. Uh, equally, um, always have been equal, uh, always have been so co-eternal, co-equal. We don't, we, that, that's foreign to us other than how we see God uh, do it and still might not make sense. All we know is this one thing. He makes it work, doesn't he? And so he has been given these things to do, to glorify. He says, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have given to me to do. And now, Father, glorify me, you. You glorify me. So what's he, when he says glorifying uh, me, uh, he could have just left it like that. But he added the sue, which is you. So, Lord, you are going to glorify me, just like I have glorified you. And he calls him father, by the way, for him to call him father, for Jesus to make this statement to be called son of God and to call himself father, the Jews understand you are making yourself out to be equal with God and to be God. Thinking about Ephesians 2. Uh, so father with your own, glorify me, father, in your own presence with the glory. And here it is that I had this word, uh, akon, pratu, this word pratu is before. So before time, cosmos, before the world, Aine, which is the the, uh, the Greek word to be or was, before the world was with uh, with you. So I had this glory with you. And so the point that he's making is give me this back. Now, I want to focus on a couple things. One, I want to talk about this work that he's bringing up. Oh, by the way, before we go there, I want to also bring in, I think it's interesting that we're going to bring up Revelation. Uh-oh, if I can spell it, Revelation 4.11. I can spell Revelation correctly. Revelation 4, 11. And notice what he says. L listen to this. He says, worthy are you, our Lord and our God. Speaking of who? Well, speaking of the Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of, you, of your will, they existed and were created. So we think back to 
uh, Colossians 1, we think back to uh, John 1, and we think back to Genesis 1. As we also think back to Matthew 28, when he says, all authority and all power have been given to now, this is after his death, burial, uh, and then subsequently his resurrection. And so this harkens back to that. But I also want to go to John 6. And there's a passage you need to see in John 6, because we need to figure out what is this work that he was sent to do? Well, he, he kind of alluded to it. And so I think it's important also that we look at this here. He says, therefore, uh, yeah, here, therefore, they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So what is Jesus's work that he speaks of in the work that he was sent to do? In John chapter 17, well, he reiterates it or he speaks about it earlier in John 6. This is the work, the reason why he was sent. As he says, in order that all the ones you've been given to me, that I will save them, that I, they will believe in me, that I will raise them all up in the last day. And so this is kind of where he's going to, I could, if we had time and this was the only thing that we were going to cover was this, just, just this John 17, we'd go more into uh, into the Greeks that there, there's some other things uh, that that I think should be brought out, should be fleshed out, like this. For example, this word "seuto," which is your, with, which is in the English translated as "presence," but it actually is yourself. So this is with you, and so Jesus is clearly making a connection with "I'm going to be with you." This glory that I had with you, this kind of this connection, and so this is kind of what he's getting at. There's more that can be fleshed out with this, and perhaps maybe one time we'll, we'll actually go over. John 17, even more in depth. But to quickly answer Jeff's question, that's it.